Now, we're not trying to say that everything you see that's identified as a UAP or UFO, that it's part of the space war, but a good deal of it is. Welcome back. I'm here again with David Morehouse. Dave, welcome back, my friend. Hi, everybody. Or I should say, hello, everybody. I've heard several podcasters that are professionals with big audiences. That's how we talk to everybody. Hello, everybody. Yeah, Sorry. I don't. A little tired. <laughs> a little tired and punchy. I haven't I've been getting like two hours of sleep a night. So, um, yeah. Hi, everybody. Yeah. It's good to see everybody again. Okay. So we're going to continue on our discussion <laughs> about what's been going on with U.S. military assets in space since 1945. Yeah. Before I go to the slides, let me just, let me set, kind of set the stage. I'm just going to go to a timeline that I created just to kind of reset that stage so people can kind of see all the things that are going on that I was just talking about using my hands last time and giving dates and names and things. And I just want to remind everybody it's, listening. And we're talking about the advent, the creation of the space wars and also the space race and why both of those supported each other, but one was really hiding the main thrust and intention of the other. And where that stood in relation to the Soviet Union and where China came in as a player or not, and where NASA came in and where the DOD space program came in. We we're also going to talk about things because originally, sort of as we were doing that, that kind of became a fascination and, and a fun fact session to talk about those things. We also wanted to jump into some things because the whole point of this when we first started was to say, we have been involved in a space war since 1945. We have been involved in a space war. We didn't actually get serious about it until Sputnik went up. And we'll look at that again. But the space war has been ongoing. And it is one of the reasons why the direct correlation to 1945 and beyond, the number of UAP sightings that occurred, it's an interesting thing. It's an interesting phenomena to see. Now, we're not trying to say that everything you see that's identified as a UAP or UFO, that it's part of the space war, but a good deal of it is. And where that is and where it stops, that's difficult to say. But so much of what you're going to see or that as we go through these episodes, I think will answer a lot of questions, not all the questions, but a lot of questions. And we'll go through some other examples tonight to show you how things can appear one way and actually be something entirely different. And there's a totally scientific explanation for that that's readily acceptable in aviation and other things. And, and you may or you may not be aware of that. A lot of the things we're talking about, you may be aware of, probably most of you are not because you're a lot younger than me. And you haven't been looking at this stuff for decades and tracking it and following it in whatever capacity. So this is not, let me prove to you that what you're saying you're seeing it isn't. That's not what I'm trying to do. And as we said last week, never going to try to say to you that there is not alien life forms out there or that there are not alien craft or that there are not unexplainable things that are in, moving in and around our atmosphere or outside of it. I absolutely understand that that is true that there are those kinds of things uh, and i understand it from a number of different angles and perceptions but there are also things that we need to learn to be careful and quality discerners of the things that we're seeing or the things that we're being told rather than you know setting our hair on fire and running around in small circles until we burn something else down not everything we're being told is true. And sometimes 
things that we're being told, we're being told them by the government or we're being told by some government contractor trying to protect their assets or whatever they're working on. And we want to talk again tonight with some examples about what a black budget project means when it transfers to gray and what happens to it then and what does a cancellation mean of those things, right? So let's kind of jump into that. So the first slide I want to go to is, this is what I yacked about the other night. I know this is really a busy slide. I'm not going to go over all of it. I just want to orient you to the slide itself. In green here, this all represents the timeline of the Department of Defense space program. The blue timeline is the NASA space program. And this timeline begins December 1945. China, you can see, starts in here. This is just the timeline itself. And this is the Soviet Union's timeline here, down here in red. So ours, as we talked about last week, the actual vision for a space war began in December 1945. And that's in the previous episode. And when that happened, the DOD, specifically the Army, the Navy, but primarily the Air Force began to be involved in the development of various capabilities and divisions to study, working with science, scientists, and they were developing immediately, as quickly as they could, missile technology and other things that could be used to be pushed forward into this new dimension of war, which was space. The Soviet Union, even though they didn't show up that we knew of, obviously, until 4 October 1957, when they put Sputnik into orbit, that was the point at which it sort of officially determined that the space war began. We were, we thought, the first into the space war with a 50-year strategic vision for a space war. 50 years in 1945. That was pretty forward thinking, and we were working on that. But it wasn't until 1947 or 48 that the Army Air Corps actually became the Air Force. And the Air Force and, and the Army and the Navy were struggling for who's going to own space or who's going to get a piece of space. And you can only guess why, right? It's because if you own that piece of the defense picture or puzzle, you get money for that. And that's what they were jockeying around for. I didn't understand where the army might play a role in that, but they had air defense artillery. They had rockets. Everything was part of the defense package for them as they were moving up into the fifties, but they were fighting for it as was the Navy. A lot of it was incongruent, didn't make sense, but that's what they were doing. In 54, January, you see the U.S. Air Force establishing their space division. They called it Western Development Division. That didn't make any sense to me. But mm -hmm. by 1958, you've got the U.S. Air Force Aeronautics Development Program, and they submitted that to the Defense Department. I shared that with you when they went to the DOD and gave their briefing for their program, the ADP. They said, we want money for and we want to do these things. We want to develop space weapons. Ways to kill whatever's going to be up there, ways to kill from there, ways to kill or develop intercontinental ballistic missiles carrying nuclear warheads, ways to kill those missiles. Those things were not things that were just being developed in the SDI many years out in the, into 1982. Those were things being talked about back in the years between 45 up to the point where they're actually now saying, we know that we can develop this technology. We have the rocket technology. We want to do these things. Give us money for that. Weapons, they also wanted an array of hypersonic vehicles. They listed a single one, which was an orbital glider, which we talked about in the last episode. But they were already working on all sorts of different types of craft, powered craft, glider craft, which means they would get into space, they could skip around the planet in orbit or skipping off the atmosphere, or they could put them into orbit and then get to a place and then re-enter and strike. 
all these things were being talked about. Everything they talked about in terms of hypersonic craft, meaning Mach 5 or greater, everything they mm-hmm. talked about. Because at that point, we weren't even supersonic. We were subsonic in piston-driven aircraft in 45. So they wanted bombers, they wanted interceptors, and they wanted ISR platforms, intelligence, reconnaissance kind of platforms. They wanted a space station where they could put astronauts. NASA didn't even exist yet. They wanted astronauts that would belong to the U.S. Air Force. That's what they wanted, and they got them. They also wanted to be able to develop satellite programs, anti-satellite programs, a whole bunch of other things that are in the previous episode they wanted. It's actually seven things that they listed. So that was all approved. And that division, the Western Development Division and the Aeronautics Development Program began working on those things. And they began bringing in contractors to work on that stuff. By 1959, They started the X-15 program. So between that time and 68, we've gone from Mach 3.2 to Mach 6.7. That's phenomenal for 1959 to up to 1968. But all of that is happening right in there. Now, but let's go down here and look at what the Soviet Union was doing. They've got Sputnik in orbit in 57. 61, Yuri Gagarin goes into orbit in Vostok 1 for an hour and 48 mm-hmm. minutes, right? In 6 August 61, we put Titov up there, who goes in Vostok 2 for 25.18 hours. We hadn't done anything like that. In 62, we put up uh, Vostok 3. Vostok 3, the following day, when Vostok 4 goes up, they do the first connection between two aircraft in 62 the fir- i mean two spacecraft they do that the russians up to this point just to list the things that the russians had been doing they put the first man in orbit yuri gregarian if that happened there's some conspiracy that it didn't and if you look at the track of yuri gregarian's life and how he eventually died yeah it, there's possibility there they put the second man in orbit They put the first woman in orbit. They did the first spacewalk. They put the first modular space station in orbit with the Solute program. They did the first Mm -hmm. two capsule link up in space. They did also have the first death in space. And they also had the second death in space. Now, in 1958, 29 July, President Dwight D. Eisenhower understands that we cannot just be in a chest-to-chest parallel race with the Soviet Union for a space war. He establishes the National Aeronautics and Space Act, which allows him to form NASA. Okay, It allows him to create NASA. When NASA is created, NASA is configured in a completely different way. The space race, it's a space race. It's all about discovery, exploration for all mankind, right? And if you look at what happens with NASA, not a lot in the first years, 58 up to 61, not enough to make an impact and cover up the ground between Sputnik, Gagarin, and Titov, right? Not enough. So President Kennedy comes in, and what he does is he finds seven to nine billion dollars. It's nine billion dollars. And it comes from Congress from a delivery of a speech of urgent national needs, not, hey, we want to get nine billion dollars so that we can involve ourselves in discovery exploration for all mankind. It's nine billion dollars for urgent national needs. Of that nine billion, which is a lot of money back then, it is split not equally between DOD and NASA. Everything I read Mm -hmm. said that the DOD got the bigger chunk of that money, but NASA had sufficient that they could, on 5 May, Alan Shepard was the first American 
to orbit. Actually, he didn't orbit, but look at what it's called. Freedom seven. Huh? It's still part of the cover that goes along with NASA to direct everybody's attention, the Soviet unions and the American people that NASA is a space exploration and discovery for all mankind. Freedom seven is the first one in the air. Okay. 69, it's Apollo. But in February 62, after Alan Shepard is up, John Glenn goes up, not in butt kicker seven. He goes up in friendship seven, right? He's up in mm -hmm. friendship seven, continuing to be part of this. So now you're seeing that there's this powerful parallel to the DOD effort. The DOD effort is space war. The NASA effort is space race. You only hear our political officials, our president on down, stand up and talk about the space race. It's a perfect way to cover up from a strategic perspective everything that's going on in the space war that is being carried forward by the DOD. Now, I'm not trying to make that as like a divisive, ugly thing. It was just a very clever way to put one project in play to cause the entire world to look at that. But at the same time, we knew that what we were doing there was causing the Soviet Union to have to keep the pace up and keep the pace up. And it was them attempting to keep the pace up that caused them in 67 to kill their first cosmonaut, which was Komarov on Soyuz 1. As the story goes, Gagarin did not want Komarov to go up. Komarov and Gagarin were good friends. And, mm -hmm. and Gagarin fought against Komarov going up because they had had all sorts of problems with the Soyuz 1. All sorts of problems. But what killed him was the fact that the drogue chute and then the main parachute of the capsule coming back in did not open. And therefore, the capsule just plummeted to Earth and struck it at whatever terminal velocity was in that particular place atmospherically. And it killed him instantly, obviously. And then they start some other things. They put up Vostok 3 and they put up Vostok 4. All of those are happening. These are combining together. And then again, they actually get a woman. They have the first woman, Valentina, on Vostok 6. And then Boyovsky, Vostok 5. One goes up on the 14th, the other comes up on the 16th. They connect the two spaceships again, and then they come back down. First woman in space, it's the second connection. And then you have a three-man crew, which was the first multi-man crew on 12 October 1961. They just keep setting the records on all of these things. That's what they keep doing. And then they kill another series of cosmonauts. They send up Soyuz 11. And Soyuz 11 actually went up and docked with Soyuz 10, but then Soyuz 11 came apart from that dock in when coming apart, preparing for reentry, they asphyxiated, they suffocated. Something went wrong with their oxygen system and three cosmonauts died in that incident. That was in 71. China did not enter into the space wars until actually in 1970, April 1970. And when they entered into the space wars, the, all they did was shoot up an inert satellite. They called it an artificial satellite. It, it served no purpose. They just wanted to see if their rocket platform could get it in to orbit and if they could calculate and get it into orbit. And it just stayed there till the orbit decayed at some point and burned back up in the end. That was their entry into the space race. They actually started sending up others. They got with the program. But they were always behind, they had well behind the US, and they were also obviously always well behind the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union, once we reached July 1969 and put Apollo 11 on the moon, the space race phenomenon was now over. And so the Soviet Union, which had tried to keep up the pace in the world's eyes, at that point, started to taper off and became more interested in the space war and were no longer felt that they were required to keep up the facade of trying to be involved in this space race, which the Americans had come up with. So space race was still there. 
And it continued on. It's not on the timeline, but we continued putting satellites up. We continued developing and testing space weapons. But NASA was really looking for recoverable craft and other things that they could do to stay involved in all of that and stay alive in all of that and help the DOD with technology and technological developments, but never be actually part of the space wars. Until when the Challenger program was developed, there were a lot of Challenger missions that were classified. And when they were classified, it meant they were putting classified things in space, which were to act hand in glove with the DOD and the space wars. They were putting up classified satellites, classified satellite killers, classified other things. We don't know, but a lot of different kinds of things. The space war and the DOD continued on active in every possible way. Something started to develop that was becoming clear, and that was kind of when we landed on the moon. Now, the Air Force started to let its budget interests not lessen, that's for sure, but drift away from their heavy involvement in the space war. But they'd already been given total control over the space war program. They had been given total control over and established themselves as the U.S. Air Force Space Force. That is what they had done. But the overseers of all of this started to realize that they were spending more money on the development of aircraft than they were on the development of the kinds of craft that we want to be capable of utilizing in the, in the space wars. They were farming that out to different kinds of independent civilian contractors. And all of those, they're way too numerous to mention. There's all of the standards that are out there, Boeing, Lockheed Martin, BAE. There are some Raytheon. There are dozens of them all working independent black budget projects that I could spend three hours just talking about each one of them and what they've been developing. But President Ronald Reagan realized with reports to people, he didn't discover it on his own, that this is what was happening in the Air Force. It was Reagan who first proposed in 82 that we establish the United States Space Force. And he wanted to do that because he wanted to remove this from the existing services and create a new combatant command called the United States Space Force that would focus its budget portion totally on the space war and not on other elements that work or needs that it thinks it has real or perceived within its particular branch. The Navy wants submarines and ships and carriers and destroyers, etc. The Air Force wants more heavy lift capability. They want faster fighters and they want bombers and they want stealth bombers and all the other things that they want, right? So Space was sort of getting diluted, but still a great deal of work and innovation ongoing there and great breakthroughs were going on there. Reagan's idea for this didn't happen because when the Soviet Union collapsed in 91, when it fell apart, it kind of put a pin in everything for everybody. There was a Soviet cosmonaut that was up in the space station who couldn't come back. And I think he was there for 380 some odd days. He couldn't come back because the Soviet Union was gone. They weren't going to launch something to go up there and retrieve him and bring him back down again. The Soviet Union ended up having to pay the French to come up and pick him up. And I think it was like $25 million price tag. That's oh. a heck of a, an Uber ride, right? They paid them to go up there, collect his buns and bring him back down again. But he was there for a very long time. When all that started to happen, the whole push towards the strategic defense initiative, a space force for the United States, people started to get kind of lukewarm on it. The DOD space effort continued because there were still things we needed to do up there, put satellites up, spy down on the former Soviet Union, now the Russians. There were still things to pay attention to. We still had potential of intercontinental ballistic missiles coming, going, kill. But you know what we're going to do. But if you'll remember, you had a guy by the name of Bill Clinton who ran for president and was elected president. One of his campaign platform promises was that he was not going to spend the money 
to support the Strategic Defense Initiative. That was a promise. He wasn't going to do that. So the Strategic Defense Initiative, which was killer satellites to kill intercontinental ballistic missiles at the zenith of their flight, they would be killed by these killer satellites, therefore not landing on the United States or anywhere else. That was the promise. But then something happened. And people never figured out what that actually was. This is a whole nother episode, and we'll talk about that, but TWA Flight 800. TWA Flight 800 was not brought down by a missile. In fact, a Tomahawk missile was involved, but what actually brought down TWA Flight 800, and this will be a fun episode to do, what brought it down was a directed energy high-powered microwave weapon that was a ground-mounted platform with acquire and fire capabilities out of Brookhaven National Labs. Dave, we did that episode. Did we do that episode? <laughs> yeah. Jeez, I guess we're doing too many episodes. Uh, <laughs> I didn't remember that. Anyway. Yeah, we definitely did. <laughs> okay. It brought that down. And the, that directed energy weapon acquired... TWA Flight 800, which was in a thing called Flight Corridor Betty. It was low and slow and late. All of the military occupational areas there, when they are in use, that's when they establish Flight Corridor Betty and inbound, outbound traffic that are flying that parallel radial going to Europe or coming back from Europe, fly from a VOR in New Jersey to a VOR in Nantucket, and they fly that VOR and they fly in that corridor. And when that radar system, which we had made many mistakes with radar before firing down an Iranian airliner, what happens is it acquires its target and it fires center of mass. And in this case, it fired a uh, directed energy weapon, this high powered microwave weapon, which struck the undercarriage. And if you understand what happens when high powered microwave weapon hits aluminum foil or aluminum in this case, aluminum skin of the aircraft, it ignited the fuel tanks and it, it blew up. It was not a missile. Why was a Tomahawk missile flying below, but it was supposed to be flying below, but it was flying and it ended up in a parallel altitude to TWA Flight 800. It was just a coincidence. They came in together. The radar picked it up and fired on the airliner, brought it down. But they were trying to hit the Tomahawk missile, the EMP on a hardened Tomahawk missile. They're trying to find the electromagnetic pulse from those microwaves hitting it. When it comes down, they wanted the seals would have pulled it out of the water. They'd have brought it back, torn it apart and figured out was the hardening good enough or they need to do something different. So it came down as part of an exercise to test a space war weapon. And the reason it was covered up is because the November elections were only three months away or two months away. And if that had happened, if that story had gotten out, it would have been the talk of all of the media outlets would have been that he said he was going to do away with the Strategic Defense Initiative. And in fact, a weapon designed for it actually just brought down an airliner. That's why it was covered up. Okay. So... Well, that continued to be developed, and that was just what we were talking about there. What happens is when Reagan tries to get this to happen, it doesn't happen. And then in 2017, which is not on the timeline, in 2017, there was a bipartisan effort to try to once again do what Reagan proposed back in 82. And in 2017, a Democratic element and a Republican element joined forces and proposed to Congress that we establish this new combatant command called the United States Space Force. It was turned down. Then President Donald Trump, I guess, had a rethink or more information, but then turned around and on 29 August 2019, President Trump formed the United States Space Force as a new combatant command. So now it no longer belongs totally to the Air Force or any of the other services. It belongs to a new branch of our military, a new combatant command. Okay. Now that's the rest of that story. And then what I wanted to show you is just really quickly this. 
That's the number of UFO sightings. It's really difficult to pin those down because if you go to some place like a MUFON or some other thing, there are so many of them that it defies being able to count it. I also can't find a, a really good source for just a year by year count of UFOs. And most of the place, it just varies so wildly that if you just go, there is a report that you can look at that's been broken down by the numbers per year that states that between 1945 and 1961, I guess, there's something like 12,000 official reports to the U.S. government of UFOs. Mm -hmm. Again, we're not saying that there are not actual craft from off this planet that are in some of those sightings. What we're saying is there's a direct correlation to the creation of the strategic vision for space war, the creation of the space war elements, and the number of craft that were being used to meet the aeronautics development program that was submitted to the Defense Department in 1958. It exponentially parallels and increases over time to where we are now, where it's just gotten more and more and more. If you just look at the raw number of reports, and again, I wish I could get you a really good number for that, but everybody reports something different. Even in the 12,000 it reported as official reports to the three different Department of Defense programs that were designed to explore those reports, the last one, Project Blue Book, that were all eventually stopped. But what the Department of Defense says that out of these 12,000 plus reports, there are only 700 plus that we actually can't identify. Okay. So I just wanted you to be aware of the fact that as the space war built, the momentum built and the number of black projects to support the space war built, the number of UFO sightings went up. Okay. You just have to understand the meaning of that. It doesn't mean that there are not alien craft that come in. It's just, there's a huge DOD element of that as well. I wanted to talk about something in this space war relevant to what we're seeing. Again, point here is not to say this is an absolute but I want to just bring this example up because it was a hot example when this thing first came out. So mm -hmm. there's a UAP photo that's taken by a U.S. Navy backseater, the backseater on his iPhone. A backseater aircraft has the pilot in the front, usually a nav guy in the back, navigator. If you look at rotary wing aircraft like Cobras and Apaches, it's the other way around. The pilot sits in the back and the gunner sits in the front. The guy that runs all the weapon systems sits in the front. But in this case, backseater pulls out his iPhone, takes a photo. Now, every reference that I could find to this photo says leaked photo. This drives me absolutely crazy. This was not an official photo. It was a photo taken by the guy in the backseat using his civilian iPhone, which looking deep beneath the layers of those claiming it was leaked, he was sending it to people. I mean, he showed it to his supervisors and undoubtedly sent them a copy of it, but releasing it to other people does not make it leaked. Leaked means it was classified, heavily guarded, nobody was supposed to see it. Give us your phone because we're going to make sure we wipe it off the phone. I get so tired of people trying to BS everybody else by claiming that it's leaked. People, the hair goes up on their neck or their antenna go up. They go leaked. Oh my gosh, it's a secret and somebody's telling it. It's not the case. Okay. The guy just gave it to people. Now, look at the size of the object through the window of this fast moving fighter aircraft. Now, I blew it up a hundred times and look at it here. Okay. It has a very unique shape. But it is referred to or described by the pilot and the backseater as hovering in the air. So if I'm looking at that, and I first of all don't recognize the silhouette or the shape of the aircraft, and the individuals on board the aircraft reported as hovering in the air, 
it's pretty darn difficult of me to say, well, that's something that is part of the DOD space program or that it's explainable. That's hard to come to that. So let's see how something like that could possibly be explained. There is a phenomenon called spatial disorientation during flight operations. That's actually a statement from the Federal Aviation Administration. They write extensively on it because it happens a lot in instrument flight and it happens a lot in just high altitude open air flight and here's what happens there's a phenomena called autokinetic illusion autokinetic illusion what happens in autokinetic illusion and it happens because of the relative velocity and the non-static reference okay and i'll explain those in a bit it means that at your speed Looking at something in front of you, you can have an autokinetic illusion that makes a stationary object look like it's traveling at your same speed. Conversely, there's another form of it that says an object traveling, even coming at you, can look like it is moving away from you at speed or that it's stationary near. So a moving object can look stationary and a stationary object can look like it's moving at your same speed. It's a trick that your brain plays on you for other reasons, relative velocity and static reference. So let's just put this experiment again, just to explain this. This is a mm -hmm. little critter called Dream Chaser. Stupid name for an aircraft that's going to be used in the space wars, but okay. This comes in many different kinds of configurations. It's in intended to carry be a cargo carrier it is autonomous and a drone cargo carrier into space carry weapons platforms sensor platforms or cargo it can dock with the international space station that's the plan for this thing down in the lower right hand corner you get an idea of its scale it's not big it's not the space shuttle it has a different purpose now because you're seeing this it means that this particular variant of this project has gone from black to gray. When it goes from black to gray, it means it's no longer classified. It's now out there for it to go into all the aviation magazines, for people to look at it, to see about it, to go, oh my gosh, et cetera. But this thing continues its black project development. And when it goes gray, and this is another way in which DOD, the Air Force, before the Space Force, covers some of these things, is it'll go gray, it'll become kind of open source, it's out there, pictures, people see it, it's in different places, they talk about it, you can go to the contractor's website, you can read all about it to certain levels, but it, it does not mean that the project's dead when it goes gray. It means that they're letting you know that this is a project that's no longer classified. The classified version of the project just takes a left turn and stays classified because they're saying this particular variant, this model, don't need it right now. There. Mm -hmm. And what will happen is three more years, maybe five more years will go down the road when everybody's thinking, well, that's it. And what's going to happen with it? And then you'll read something that goes, oh, yeah, we're canceling that. We're not doing that anymore. They're canceling that one, the gray one. The black one is still, is probably two more variants, you know, versions of where it was or three more versions compared mm -hmm. to the pace that we're now, we're carrying with, right? But that's what it means. That's why you're seeing these things. Now, I needed a two seater aircraft for this experiment that I wanted to show you. So I chose the Air Force's newest fighter, the F 15 EX. Now, I'm not a fighter pilot. I'm a special operations infantryman. So I have no idea if what they say about this aircraft is, but this is what the Air Force has apparently chosen to buy for themselves, not the Raptor or the other stuff. They want this one. They're supposed to be one has better performance characteristics than the other, but this one is the one that they like. And it's the fastest fighter in the world right now at just under Mach 3, M less than three, right? So it travels at 1,918.17 miles per hour, and that's fast. And it can cruise at 1,400 miles per hour up to 1,900 miles per hour 
they call that its cruising speed. And the higher it goes, the faster it can go. So let's put that into the mix just because it's a fast two-seater aircraft. And let's talk about that. Now, remember, we go back here, 15,000 miles per hour, Mach greater than 20. It's almost 21. It's, it, it's actually 20.5, something in that neighborhood. 15,000 miles per hour. So it comes back into the Earth's atmosphere at 15,224 miles per hour. And from where it enters the atmosphere to where it lands, it goes from 15,000 down to its landing speed, which is 350 knots indicated airspeed. Now, I don't know what the landing speed is on this, but it doesn't matter for this explanation. If we put these things together and try to illustrate for all of us about how things can appear stationary. So here again, we've got this objective photo, which could be the dream chaser. It could be a lot of other things, but the dream chaser works now. Look at the profile and look at that profile. Okay. And so object A and object B. Now, this is it still bigger than what it looked like when it was coming down out of orbit. So this aircraft is flying at a fairly significant speed and at a very high altitude. And because you can see in the photo from the window that they can see the curvature of the Earth and you can see what's down below them. And this means that as high as they are, as clear as it is, all the cloud cover is way down below them. They have no visual references by which to gauge speed. The only velocity known in object A is what the pilot can see on his airspeed indicators. He can look at that, but he has no idea what he's looking at, how fast that is going or how slow it's going. The only way he would ever know that is if he had radio contact with it and could call it up. The only other way he could calculate it is if there was some third point of reference, he could visually calculate it. So he could tell if it was going away from him or coming toward him or other things, but this appears stationary to him. He's experiencing this autokinetic illusion, this spatial disorientation in flight. And that is caused because he doesn't know what the relative velocity is. His brain cannot calculate relative velocity because he has no static reference point. It's like he's in a giant fishbowl of no references, but blue sky and the earth so far below that he can't really even tell, not in that split second. So if he's traveling at one speed, as you see in the indication here, Mm -hmm. And this other aircraft comes down out of the atmosphere at 15 and begin pops out its air brakes and be, begins slowing itself. They are both headed probably for close to the same destination. But what happens now is they are on a parallel flight path. Parallel. And when that happens, as soon as the speed of the fighter and the near speed or velocity of that object, as soon as they get to a point of being close to equal, and we don't know exactly what that is because we have no way to tell what the velocities were, his brain turns around because of no static reference. It's confused about the relative velocity. The autokinetic illusion steps in and the object appears to be holding stationary. The object isn't stationary. The object is moving at fast speed, equal to maybe exceeding theirs, slowing down, getting ready for its approach to come into landing. But to them, it appears stationary. There was no discussion of them flying past it. It just was stationary until they pulled off and it continued on its flight path. So that's an explanation. You can look at the formula down here. But in the formula, VAB equals VB minus VA. That's how you calculate the relative velocity. There's a delta between those two craft. One might be going faster, the other one slower. But if you know what those velocities are, then you can calculate the relative velocity. 
But the way you have to do that, if you don't know the indicated airspeed in either craft, is you have to have velocities established of the objects with respect to a third observer, of which there is none. The third observer is displaced by what is called the static reference point. So if you're going mm -hmm. past a mountain range or you're going past a giant cloud bank that's at your altitude, you start to get that third observer perspective where you now can calculate the relative velocity of both objects. And you can tell if it's leaving, if it's going further faster, or if it's coming to you, or if it would be indeed actually really stationary, which in this particular case, I don't believe the evidence supports that. It could be other kinds of craft that are out there now. These craft mm -hmm. are being developed as hybrid airships being built with DARPA. DARPA is highly classified DOD program developing things that are being used in support of the space wars and beyond. And this first version, this one, the original work, as you can read, started in, in 1980, but this particular version, 120 foot long, this trilobe, as it's called, the skins on these are different. These things are in, uh, intended to be heavy lift, to pick up, to go to extraordinarily high altitudes. At higher altitudes, the reason they want to be there is they can fly faster. These airships can't fly all that fast down in the thick atmosphere of the lower altitudes within our atmosphere. But when they can get up high and they can get into thinner air carrying larger, heavier loads, they can move faster. And I'm going to show you some in a little bit that will kind of astound you to where they can go. So looking again, I couldn't reorient the LEMB, but again, if you were to spin that thing around and looking at this object now blown up even larger, you can see how that LEMB from Northrop Grumman could fit the profile of that right there. And the only thing that would disqualify this example in the experiment is that thing doesn't enter the atmosphere at 15,000 miles an hour and wouldn't be slowing down to anything near the speed or the velocity of that fighter jet. So that kind of disqualifies it. But from a profile perspective, I think mm -hmm. it's interesting. And there we go again, you know, the, how the trilobe and how that might be. We'll see. Now, I was going to talk about weapons, but I'm going to stop weapons here for a minute. I'm going to go to something different because we're trying to keep this down to a reasonable time frame just for you guys. I know I talk for a long time and I'm talking faster than I normally do. I just don't want to lose you guys. Okay. I want to explore another explanation or possible explanation. Again, I'm not presenting anything here as an absolute. I'm just telling, let's learn how to be discerning, careful listeners, and let's try to think about what this might mean or be when we're looking at this. So in 97, what is called the Phoenix Lights, there's a large V-shaped craft with five spherical undercarriage lights that's observed between the hours of 1930 and 2030 uh, out in the West Coast. It's described as a stationary or slow-moving UFO, UAP, traveling across the distance of space of 300 miles from the Nevada state line to Phoenix and then on to Tucson. Thousands of people observed this craft and literally hundreds of them filed official reports with law enforcement agencies and with media outlets saying, you got to see this. And apparently many responded. This is how it was described again. Observers, hundreds of them, said that it was huge. It had a 60 degree angle to it, like a carpenter square with five spherical lights, one in the nose and two on each side. I gave you an illustration here. A carpenter square is actually 90 degrees and it's not huge. It goes at a 90 degrees, but the craft had 60 degrees. So you can kind of see there, the craft doesn't look like this. It looks more like that. Okay. Observers reported the craft was anywhere from 100 to 150 feet above them, but other people on higher ground when it came over because people went into the path of its movement. And there were people that reported that they were able to throw rocks and things like tennis balls at the bottom of the craft and actually hit the bottom of the craft. I'm not so sure. If I actually thought it was an alien spacecraft, I would go throw tennis balls and rocks at it. But apparently some did. Not to steal your thunder, but my old thesis advisor, Ash Carter, the guy who became 
Obama's Secretary of Defense. He worked for Casper Weinberger way back in the 80s. And one of the things that they were looking at was how to redeploy or to keep MX missiles, the warheads on them, constantly deployed so the Russians couldn't find them. So one of the things that they looked at or one of the options was putting it on a dirigible or an airship and flying it all over the United States. Besides being an obviously terrible idea, the one thing that they discovered is in, as part of the research, he called the Goodyear Blimp Company and said, like, are there any like weird things that happen? And they're like, yeah, like we collect shells, like shotgun shells and stuff like that, because Bubba sits on his back porch and takes a shot here and there. So long story oh. short, the tennis ball thing is totally within the realm of uh, kind of the bubbas out there in the world. <laughs> I can see it. I can see uh, young folk, you know, in Phoenix, you know, driving up to the local mountainous spot, kicking the rattlesnakes out of the way, knocking the Gila monsters off the rocks and making tennis ball cannons or something and shooting them up at the strange alien spacecraft. It's slowly moving past them, the 100 to 150 feet above them. But the military came in and gave an explanation for this. And that some of them are legit and some of them are not. The first thing that they said from the military was that uh, there's an Operation Snowbird at David Motham Air Force Base. And that is true. It's kind of an annual thing where what they do there is there are Air National Guard units that come there for like their annual training pilot recertification. They do all sorts of training things. In this particular case, one of the frequenters there is the A-10 Thunderbolt II aircraft. A-10 is a close air support aircraft, or I mean, ground support aircraft. And if you've ever been uh, a soldier on the ground and needed an aircraft to really come in and kick the snot out of whatever's trying to kill you, A-10s are those. They're an amazing, amazing aircraft. You should watch some YouTube video on them if you want. Yes, so close air support. Tankers like me love them. We oh. actually went to Nellis and got to see a demonstration. They're the they're the ones that you know, I don't. I mean, this sounds like a burt, like burp, burp, yeah, like, like a big burp like gun. Little, yeah, that's that that yeah. cannon on the front. Yeah, the, you know, the thirty millimeter like a, Gatling gun. Yeah. yeah. It's unbelievable. They're, they are vicious. And I mean, they look good. I mean, they, the, the sound that the, the engines make and it's a very distinct, right? You can hear them. And they are the guys that, you know, do a gun run and then, you know, flip upside down. And it's like, they're just really amazing where other fast movers are typically up so high. You, you really hear them. And then if you're lucky, you'll catch them and they drop bombs from so high up. It, it, sometimes it's hard to see them. But these guys are I, down low, you know? I think the Air Force is actually trying to replace them with the Hangar Queens, the F-35. I know that for decades, the Army has been trying to get the A-10. And because of the ground support role that they play, the Air Force has always fought against that because they're like, no, <laughs> no, no, we'll keep them, we'll modify them, we'll keep doing them. But they're a hard airplane to replace. And when I was in Commander General Staff College, one of my table mates was an F-117 pilot, one of the stealth fighters. And he actually was one of the lead pilots that went into Gulf War I. And he told me that he was trained in A-10s and then converted, transitioned into the F-117, and that he was trying really hard to get back to the A-10s. He hated flying the F-117 because he said, it's like a video game. It's no fun because it's not like being a real pilot. So he goes, I, I don't want to do it. He goes, if they won't let me go back to the A-10, I'm going to get out of the Air Force. I'm going to resign. It's like, whew, that's drastic. You got to really hate the F-117 because it's, there's nothing fun about it because it's all electronics and stuff. And it's not like you're looking out the window going, yeehaw, you know, doing big steep banking turns and things like that. It's a totally different way of flying. Anyway, I kind of got it, but I didn't get it. But the A-10s were there. And so 
The next one is an FAA statement. It said, okay, because it's people were asking, well, why is this craft, whatever it is, why does it not have anti-collision lights? You know, the blinking lights, red on the left, green on the right, white on the tail. You know, that's how other aircraft know whether an aircraft is coming toward them or away. It's the same thing in, you know, maritime navigation, same setup. Lights on a boat are red on the left and green on the right and white on top. That's how you know whether it's coming at you or going away from you. So the FAA said, well, you know, the U.S. Air Force doesn't have to abide by the same rules as Federal Aviation Administration specifies for civilian pilots. So I just looked that up. So I read the entire Air Force in-flight manual. They have a manual that covers everything. That you're supposed to do now there's the general manual and then there's manuals that are specific to certain aircraft in every manual that i could read it said when it came to collision lights and lights it tells when landing lights come on when landing lights can go off it says that before you start the engine you must turn on your anti-collision lights or sometimes called navigation lights navigation lights i think are more landing lights and stuff like that but you have to turn your lights on before you start your engine and so it did say that that is a requirement in the Air Force manual. There was another paragraph that said in paragraph 3.22.4, major commands may authorize reduced or lights out operation in restricted areas, warning areas, host nation approved areas, or designated airfields. Typically what they're saying here is in combat, you can turn that stuff off. You don't have to put any collision lights on. But it has to have a signature from a major command. So I don't know in the Air Force if the commander of the unit as a lieutenant colonel could do that. That's not a major command. I don't even think a major command would be the commander of that Air Force base. A major command would have to be somebody that is over that whole area for the air force to bypass something like that they are an extraordinarily safety conscious branch of the military they why because be. yeah it, you have to be you don't want to have a bunch of aircraft out there even with night vision goggles on the only time i've ever seen aircraft turn off anti-collision lights with night vision goggles on was in capabilities exercises for the joint special operations command at the place where we do those things in Fort Bragg, North Carolina. And in those cases, even in, you know, any of the support vehicles and things where they would take the dumb lights out of the support vehicle. So when they opened the door or something, it wouldn't light the area. And I have seen C-130s land, no landing lights. They have infrared landing lights that the pilots wearing their night vision goggles. It illuminates with infrared, but they don't put any collision lights on. Not even when they get on the ground, start the taxi, because the capabilities exercise has to be done in the total dark to impress the people that are there watching it, which are always congressmen and senators and et cetera. So that's the only time I've ever seen it turned out. Even in training exercises, they make them turn them on because it accidents happen. I mean, when I was a Ranger Company commander at Hunter Army Airfield, the guy two doors down from me was a Cobra pilot. And he lifted off and when he lifted off out of a small landing zone where he had come down doing an auto rotation in the dark he had his landing lights on and he came up out of that and cleared the georgia pine trees and when he cleared them a ch-47 helicopter with its anti-collision lights on came and the two collided and both air crews were killed and both aircraft lost and it was a really horrible accident that's stuck quick it can happen so turning off the landing lights or anti-collision lights or things like that can happen, but it's extraordinarily rare. And I don't know why they would be doing it if they did do it, why they would do it for Air National Guard pilots that are there to do training recertification. That's just something that's true and or a possibility, right? It's maybe it happened, maybe it didn't. Either way, it has nothing to do with this. I mean, it has everything to do with this. That was the military explanation. This is how the military is saying. We weren't them because we don't have any collision lights on. When people ask, 
Why were the anti-collision lights not there? The other thing is that the light seen at 2200 hours, which is the far end of this, right? The light seen at 2200 hours, the military claimed that these were LLU2 Bravo slash Bravo illumination flares that are dropped from the four AC-130s over Barry Goldwater Air Force range. Indeed, there were illumination flares that were dropped. But those illumination flares that were dropped were not what people were reporting. You can tell the difference. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. lights that are in a pattern underneath an aircraft yeah, uh, that's flying over you, right? Illumination flares come down on a parachute and they swing and smoke pours off of them and the parachute comes down. And there's no trick to your eyes when you're seeing them. And I've seen them in every... There's 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 a recent sighting of like a triangular shaped aircraft on a Marine Corps base in Southern California in 2021. And one of the <clears throat> skeptics, let's call it, their leading theory was this illumination flare thing, which is just look, I'm not trying to find UFOs in the site, but it's if you've ever seen them in practice, and I saw them plenty of time, like it's more likely to be demons than it is to be an air you know to be illumination players you know it's just it's it's utterly preposterous it's utterly true. ridiculous yeah yeah especially when you have something what in illumination flare it is whether it comes right. from artillery piece do tanks fire a loom no but like i've you know you've had those star clusters that you have in your hand where you like pop them yeah 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 but that, that that's even worse i mean that's well, it goes up 150 feet but yeah, yeah so I mean, I've seen illumination flares out of 4.2 inch mortar, 81 millimeter mortar, really crappy ones out of 60 millimeter mortars, and out of artillery pieces, 105, 155. But, you know, it's like, come on. It's so easy to tell the difference. So when the military does that, I really question. Again, we have to be. I, I question the disinformation we agent because they're not very yeah, intelligent. Right. Right. Before I. Read, I, you know, researched and found that it was A10s. I kept thinking to myself, having been an 81 millimeter mortar platoon leader at one time, I was just wondering, like, who came in, sent out an A level alert, and had an entire mortar platoon come in, and it ran the guy down from 1930, ran the guy down, picked up ammo, got him out to some firing point, and told him to start shooting a loom out, you know, so that they get, and somebody going, I want, five of them hanging in the air at all times kind of thing. It would have just been ridiculous. Even to have A-10s flying around and go, hey, we need you guys to drop five flares and there we go. Or each one of you drop one So as a flight of four. It's just stupid. But that's what was said. There's one more. There were some more sightings, you know, February 2007. But again, it was reported by the military's flares. And hey, it probably was in this case when you see what I'm talking about. And then in April 2008, everybody started because everybody was primed now, right? Because they had seen it in 97. So in 2008, the whole memory of this thing comes back again. And this time, listen to the description. It started as a square and then it turned into a triangle. Okay. So it turned into something it morphed into something else a guy goes to the local newspaper out to the police and says hey that whole thing everybody's dancing around the fire on that was my next door neighbor he was sending flares up tied to helium balloons like big giant weather balloons i mean they're like what are they like a, they're, when they air them up when you fill them with helium they're like a meter across right you know, and meteor hide, they're big and they can lift flares for sure. And they fly a long way. And if he released them all from his backyard, which the guy turned around and said, yeah, I did that. Uh, I, did. I just thought it would be funny. So remember this, that once again, I know you guys aren't fooled by that, but a lot of people are. We have to be discerning. We have to ask questions first and try to find the best answer we can for it. And hey, Sometimes there won't be a good answer for that. And then we have to accept that it's unexplained and that's cool too. Yeah. So, but in that case, another big sighting, it's on the books, but it was a faker. So what could this be? Here we go. Now, this whole new class 
of, they're calling them aerospace orbital airships. These are massive. This is still a black program, but these are artist concepts of this black program. And these things were being tested from 1964 on. JP Aerospace has been one of the big lead developers, but every, every one of the air and space divisions has got a dog in this fight. There are three things that are going to be developed with these particular craft as part of the space war. First of all, they are massive. This one in this drawing here is 500 feet long on any one of the pontoons. 500 feet long. And they end up being somewhere like up to five and more stories tall. And I'll show you one that you can actually see a human next to it, which is the one that services this one. This is a, an orbital airship. This has a particular job to do that when they are up in space, they can go supersonic. They can go to Mach 3. When they get up to 400,000 feet, there are versions that are classified that can be hypersonic. So hypersonic flight from a heavier than air orbital airship that goes up there. They are real. If that thing got off its leash, because these versions are unmanned, they are primarily designed to be weapons carriers. They can be bombers. They can launch anti-satellite missiles. They can carry cargo. They could carry people. But the intention, for the most part, as I have researched and read, is that they're intended to be unmanned and to be in orbit traveling very quickly. So when you're up there at that height, you're in a vacuum, very near a vacuum. And so with minimal propulsion, and these can, things can carry fuel supply with them, and they can move very quickly, and they can transit a great deal of ground and get over a target or get to a place where they need to then descend or resupply or do whatever they need them to do. They're a very versatile platform. And the way that they're made is not like, you know, the Zeppelins of old. They're, they're completely different and very strange fabrics and coatings on them. And questions were asked like, well, what if it gets hit by a meteor? Well, because it's not under super high pressure, because the pressure is regulated to sustain the lift and keep the rigidity of how it is constructed, you know, its airframe, that a meteor would go straight through it. It would hit it boom, boom, and punch out. And all they would need to do, if it was unattended to, it would slowly leak its gas and slowly, you know, come out of its orbit. But if it were in a place where they had the ability to sense that it had been punctured, which they will and do, then all they need to do is repair it. And it because it's not under high pressure, it, it's not like it sucks everything inside of it out in the vacuum of space, just slowly dribbles mm -hmm. the gas out. Okay, that's the orbiter. This is called the transatmospheric ascender. This is the craft that goes from the ground up to something else but it can go up to 140,000 feet to the actual edge of space. This thing is out there. The one in the lower right it is one that flies now. They have solar-powered motors on them, drive systems. They have solar-powered electronics. Again, it can carry people. This particular one, it comes in these three different sizes. You've got the A26, which means that the pontoons are 26 then A30 36 feet long, then the Ascender 90 is 90 feet long, and the Ascender 175 is the one I would think probably what was seen over Phoenix. It, it's 175 feet long. The actual cells, the, the pontoons on them, are five stories high. That's the one that's actually five stories high. Are these currently in deployment right now? <laughs> yes. Yeah. And when you're seeing pictures of them like this and concepts, 
Those are black projects, but the picture you're seeing down in the lower right, that is a gray project now. They're just testing new materials and new ways of rigidity, materials that will help them be able to sustain up and longer because there is some degree of leakage and stuff like that. There's all kinds of things that are going on there with it. But this craft is designed to do something else. And because they're in the test, when they're testing them, particularly when they're testing them as black, which the one you're seeing in the lower right, that wouldn't be, again, that's gray. They've gone way past that. And where they've gone way past it is the things that you're, that probably you saw over Phoenix, because that's a black project. If it wasn't a black project, then they would have just said, yeah, you know, JP Aerospace, let one off the wire. You know, they're unmanned and they're flying it around. And that was the explanation. But it probably came out of the Nevada test range, Area 51, and got off the leash, so to speak, meaning whatever happened failed in their ability to control it. There are a number of hangars there that have the control towers. They had all set like at certain hangars. And there'll be four radio control towers, which are the same kinds of things you see like in Creech Air Force Base, where they fly mm -hmm. drones oh, over drones, in yeah. Yeah, Afghanistan. They're flying, sitting in Creech and flying a drone in Afghanistan. So they have these big towers that broadcast the radio waves that allow the pilots to do that. And the pilots sit in special little modular command stations that are like, air conditioned Connex boxes set up like office inside of them and they set their cockpit, you know, you've seen it on uh, the movies. That's the way it is. And they fly that aircraft just like they're flying it. They're just sitting on the ground wearing a Nomax flight suit anyway. So this is what the ascender service is. And this is where the orbital parks as well to pick up whatever it needs. This is a manned space station. It was, before it went gray, it was called the Airship to Orbit, the Dark Sky Station. So you can see here the Ascender approaching to dock. Again, artist concepts here. I don't actually know if this one's an artist concept. It looks like an actual photo, but the others don't. This one's clearly constructed and constructed. In the center would be... I, I, bet, you, I bet you they're all artist photos because who's taking that picture? Unless they have a satellite that's right nearby. I, I have no idea. I don't know. It could have been, well, any... could have been a space station going by. I don't know. I would doubt it very seriously if it were the real dark sky station that it would be there or whatever it's now called. Uh, if the whole concept of this is released into the gray world for people to see it, then it means that they've moved past this, as I said earlier. How many of these things do you think they have up at any one time? Well, well let's just say... Let me just slide back here. This is an actual representation of the number of registered and unregistered satellites. This is not space debris. These are satellites. There may be some dead satellites there, but... That's the Earth covered, and each one of those dots represents the current position of a registered or unregistered satellite. Registered mm -hmm. satellites are every country that puts one up, no matter what the function of the satellite is, they will have to register it so that it's known and people will know what's there and where it is and what it's supposedly doing. Unregistered satellites, of which there are a large number mean that they're classified satellites that have been put up by whoever puts them up there. And while there is an agreement, you're supposed to let them know real or perceived enemies don't, right? We don't, some of them, and they don't, some of them. So they have probably a nefarious nature. They are there for a reason that we don't want to tell other people about. And that's just the nature of war and the way it's being fought. I have no idea. Some of these things are in geosynchronous orbit and some of them are not. They're in various adjustable orbits. Those are usually the ones that are closer around. And then the others, some of them are looking out. Some of them are looking in. You can see it's a busy sky. It's a busy space, right? 
And the scale there is accurate, but they wouldn't appear as big as that, right? Obviously, they just put them it, there so you can actually see them. But there is there, I don't know. Is there any there particular there. reason there's a very distinct elliptic around mm-hmm. Earth at that particular distance? Uh huh. You see what I'm talking about? Uh huh. Yeah. yeah. It has uh, to do with this is the defining line for, as I recall, for the radiation belt that's present. This is one of the reasons why the uh, Van Allen belt is that okay. This is one of the places where a lot of skeptics of the actual moon landing are saying that we couldn't have put anybody in a spacecraft and gone through the Van Allen belt and kept them alive through that. But obviously that did happen. And obviously there is a way that we have to do that. And maybe the calculations that it's as destructive to human tissue as we might think it is, you know, from people doing the calculations back here on the surface, maybe we found something different there. But I believe that there's a limitation to where they will put something that they want to be in position for a very long time looking Mm -hmm. and watching. Because over time, apparently, passing through is one thing, but parking yourself in it is another. It has a tendency, I guess, to damage things. I don't know if it's like it's damaging antennas or solar panels or fuel cells or batteries or imaging devices or things. I don't know. It's not my expertise in that area, but I know that there was a reason for why they bring things out to that and then, and then park them in that orbit. If that makes sense. Yeah. So just back to this. Here's an example down here on the lower right. You can see that's a actual live picture. There's a human. So you can see it's five stories high, if if not six. And this is the Ascender, 175 feet long. It's a massive airship. And then these, the orbitals are even bigger, even bigger. And if you're just comparing apples to apples, this craft and the angles of 60 degrees and, and uh, 40 degrees, and etc. It fits the description of what was seen. And these balloons are being tested, manufactured and tested. They are tested at that Air Force Base. They are tested at the Nevada Test Range and they are Area 51 and they are tested up in Dugway. That's one of the big places. And then there are two other military bases in close proximity where they also occasionally play a role. But things can go wrong, and when they go wrong and one of these gets off its leash, it's not like it's dangerous, but now everybody's freaked out because you look up, and I would freak out too if I didn't know that those things were there. It You see it come down in the dark with illumination lights shining down. So that explains what that is. Now, next episode, we're going to get into a whole smoke and load of exotic craft and exotic space weapons we're going to jump into those i have so many things to show you and i think it'll be a lot of fun because you're going to look at that and go oh that's what somebody described over there oh yes that and you're going to see things that you've never seen unless you've really been digging into this stuff and you're going to see that again it doesn't replace all uaps and ufos that have ever been seen but it answers the question on a lot of things and it also shows you where some of the black stuff that's still there, the black projects that are there. Because what I'm going to be showing you are black to gray projects, mostly gray, one black that I'll be able to show you, but it's a probably a gray variant now, or you wouldn't even be able to see it. It'll be a lot of fun for you to see that stuff and see where the space war program for Department of Defense has taken us since 1945. It's really some cool stuff. All right. And we're, we'll get some anti gravity stuff, maybe, right? Maybe. Yeah. Well, alleged anti gravity. We're going to look at some patents. Yeah. We'll look at patents. Yeah. When we get into propulsion systems, we'll look at all that stuff. There's some really cool stuff that the Air Force, the Navy, and civilians have patented, which makes sense to my physics mind. All right, my friend. As always, a pleasure. And look forward to talking to you on the next episode. Yeah, thanks everybody. If you enjoyed this video, 
please click on like, subscribe, and the notification button so that you're alerted anytime I post something new. Oh, my God.